So today we're going to be looking at more effective meetings and uh, it's fair to say that uh, we all spend an awful lot of time in in meetings these days and it can be quite a challenge to, to keep on top of everything that's going on. And if you think back to where we were in 2021 and the world changed the way that it did, uh, I certainly believe there's been a, an accelerated change to the adoption of live meetings and on calls. You know, pre-21 we were probably doing a lot more audio calls than we're now doing video. And the stats back that up. Recent stats that have said that the time spent on video has risen from 48% uh, to 77% in 2022. And now that 83% of employees in certain roles spend almost a third of their time on live video meetings. And on average, some professionals in certain roles in policing and other sectors are spending half their working week in a live video meeting. So it's a huge amount of data. And this has come from uh, the Gitnux uh, market data report. Uh, so it's really important that we perhaps understand that we've really got to get value out of our, our meetings and the time that we're spending in there. But the evidence suggests that perhaps some of our meetings aren't as effective as we'd like to think they are. Um, Audio calls, about 7%, 57% of people are admitting that when they're doing an audio call, they may well be doing other things. It's likely less when, you, less when you're doing video, but we have to ask ourselves, is trying to do things, two things at once, making us better? Or actually allowing us to fail at both and you can see on the chart there some of the things that people are doing and let's be honest now how many of you are actually eating your lunch whilst watching this webinar or perhaps perhaps listening in and checking your emails we actually design these webinars to take place live on a lunchtime on a wednesday so that people can access us when they're perhaps not in other meetings so we're a little bit guilty of it ourselves in doing this uh, but let's be honest does the quality of our understanding and work go down when we're trying to do two things at once. Are we focused and engaged in the content of a meeting or are we sending slightly poorly written, poorly worded emails or responding to things? Now, the technology can't solve the problem of a boring meeting or a poorly chaired meeting, but what we can do is perhaps help ensure that we're using the right tools in the right way and getting the most value out of the meetings that we're in and to improve the experience for everybody. And so we all feel as though we're contributing a little bit more. I'm going to talk through th what I call, and these aren't perhaps what Microsoft describe them as, but perhaps what our experience relates to. Uh, there's three core types of uh, category of meeting that you can see on, on the screen at the moment. Uh, simple meetings are the ones that we have every day. There may be a small team meeting. It's not not a huge number of people. It may well be a calendared reoccurring meeting, or it could be an ad hoc meeting that you press meet a whole group in the team right now. Those are the things that we can all do. One point of difference to that is that's usually a small number of people where everybody's got the same rights of interactivity and we want those informal structures to take place and they're really valuable meetings. They are the sort of things that replicate what you would do if you were in an office altogether. When it gets to over around 20 people or you've got people joining from many different agencies, Running a meeting can be quite challenging online, and this is where you might need to be using some of the large format meeting tools. Now, the reason they're all in that dark purple box is that's exactly the same team's experience for both. It's just you may want to start to think about using more tools and more interactivity to manage that meeting and to make them more useful. However, for a large format meeting, you do have some other options, and we'll come to them in a little bit later on in perhaps in terms of how you arrange them. But think about the tools that you have at hand. When you've got more than a few people in a meeting, quite often you'll have the chair who's presenting or the organiser, and then you might have colleagues who are contributing a, a great deal and others who are always perhaps to be more listening or learning in that session. Teams does allow you to, to set those delegates permissions in the sidebar and to have those permissions where you can perhaps make it that people who join who aren't have a direct or key role in the meeting but are listening and participating, you can have it so their microphones are switched off by default and in fact that they cannot unmute easily until such point you can do that. But the beauty of the large format meetings is you can actually turn on that functionality through the meeting options quite simply and easily whenever you need to. And that can add some real value to what's going on. So let's take you through some of those options. Uh, 
We'll talk about live events a little bit later. They are changing to town hall if you've seen some of the announcements. But with this, we are using a lot of live events right now for this event. But we'll just go into some basic things about simple meetings. So the core functionality in simple meetings is that plan, planning and recording. You can pop the agenda into the meeting. You've got all probably familiar with the record and transcripts, but how many of you are using captions during live meetings? The captions are really designed primarily for people with accessibility needs, but they can really help in any meeting for any user to help focus on what's being said. Captions are available in multiple languages, but one of the things I've found is particularly if you're doing a hybrid type meeting where you might have multiple people in one room, you might find it easier when the audio isn't perhaps as clear as it could be to turn the captions on so you can hear, see what's being said in by multiple people who are using a shared microphone. One of the things that perhaps we're not aware of and using as much as possible is the recap function that was launched into Teams meetings a few months ago, and that fits into the meeting notes as well. You see on the screen on the on the right hand side there that you've got the recap button when you go back into a meeting and that will contain everything that you need to catch up on a meeting. So you, you can play back the recording through it through there. You can click a button and read the transcript, but any content that's been shared in that meeting, the PowerPoints you can see have already been attached into there as well. What you should see there as well is if meeting notes were used, and this is where you can everybody in the meeting can actually contribute to the notes in live time so that you can capture the key decisions and points made during each meeting. If you if you miss the meeting or want to go back, the recap button will hold all that information as a simple summary there that allows you to get a lot more value out of that. You can see the other options are still there, the details, the files, the, the recording and transcripts, but the recap button is one of those powerful tools tools that brings everything together that if you missed part of the meeting or when missed the whole meeting you want to get back you can go in there and see the notes that have been put on and I think this is where we can all start contributing to meetings more by adding more notes into the session as, as you go along recording the decisions that are made in a note and that way it's visible to everybody who comes on. The other thing you can do in simple meetings that perhaps again you might be collaboratively working is use the whiteboard functionality. Now many of us are familiar with whiteboard and we've used it a few times, but you can actually have the whiteboard attached to the meeting without having to leave the meeting space. So you can simply create a whiteboard whilst you're in the meeting and that meeting whiteboard will then be connected to that meeting rather than being an independent whiteboard where you're managing access to. So everybody automatically gets access to the whiteboard who's in the meeting and can start to contribute and work with you. Of course, with the in, in the force tenants, depending on the security settings have been set up. You'll also see the polls function. Now let's see if I can get to, uh, I don't think I can show this live because one of the challenges of course is you can't always share live uh, Teams live, Teams meetings in a live event because it, it just becomes a little bit complicated hence I'm having to use the slides today. Sticking into a little bit more de depth around this as well. One of the common phrases heard other than you're on mute when you're in a meeting is you're sharing the wrong slide or can you see my deck? Now, the easiest way of doing this in, in Teams now is to, to have your PowerPoint and present in Teams. Now, sadly, I can't do that to, in a live event at the moment, but that's changing in Town Hall. But if you head over to PowerPoint and look on the top button, you will see the Present in Teams button. Click that, and after a few seconds, the Teams meeting you're in will suddenly start to share the presentation that you want to share. And there's a few important things about this that makes the presenter's experience better. So if you're having a look at this, this slide, I'll just get back onto it there. You can still get the experience of being able to see the other people in the meeting across the top of the bar. You've still got all your controls that you'd normally have and you've got your meeting chat or per people, whichever the, the right hand tabs you've had open will be there. But what you now get in your team's environments is your PowerPoint slide and the whatever is in the red box and you can just about make it out there is what the other delegates and people in the meeting will be seeing. So that allows you still to see the reactions and people putting their hand up on top of it and be control of the slides. You can see your next slides along the bottom of the screen so you can jump straight to the next slide if you want to or you can use the arrow. 
But importantly, then you also get these extra tools. So you get a larger pointer. Now, I've already set my mouse to have a, a larger pointer where when I'm doing these webinars to make life easier. But if I haven't got that setting and I wanted to point to things on, on the slide, I can select the little arrow option or the laser pointer option and I can point to the relevant part of a slide that I want to make a point about there. You've even got highlighters and rubber buttons and things like that and you still get your notes uh, on the side of the slide. So if you put notes into your PowerPoint, it's all there. So this makes it for presenting a PowerPoint a lot easier in a team's environment and making sure that you're able to as a presenter, still focus on, on the reactions, see the comments coming in, participate in the chat while still having that presentation. And of course, one of the things that you can do in a Teams meeting that people don't realise is sometimes it's hard to focus on the content with all the faces on there. There is the pop out button, you can see it there. That allows you to pop any shared screen out separately for, from your Teams meeting. If you're lucky enough to use two screens, you may have put the meeting on one screen and your pop out on another screen, again, allowing you to focus on the content and really get involved in, in that thing without having to think, I can't see the chat anymore, etc. So all those functions are sitting there in your PowerPoint Live functionality, again, helping you to present your meeting more effectively. Then you can, the interactivity is the key to any good meeting. And there's some changes of functionality coming along the lines. Now, polls are another part of that. Now, that's very, very closely associated to Microsoft Forms. So if you were pre-planning an event, you might use Forms to create polls for it. But if you click on the little tab button at the bottom in your chat, you can add a poll to any meeting. And again, that's been created recently as well. So you now have multiple choice, uh, a word cloud or a rating uh, or a ranking as well. That can be really useful when you're collaboratively working or a quiz. And the difference with the quiz is you can mark what the right answer is as people vote to get that feedback. Again, anything you can do to create that interactivity and focus on the meeting is all sitting there. And you can just about see in the grayed out section there some examples of how you're feeling today. Again, it tries to bring that focus back into the meeting. Now, policing has become very familiar with a product called Slido over the last few years, and Slido is, allows you to have that integration. One of the challenges has always been is it's a separate pane of glass, a separate application, and that can be great for an in-person event when you perhaps not got your force technology, but when you're doing a Teams meeting, do you really want to be doing that? Now, they say flattery is the best uh, form of uh, sorry copying something is the best form of flattery and uh, one of the recent changes to the microsoft forms button is the new presents button that's appeared and that basically creates a very similar environment to just like you were familiar with a slido where you can have your light form posted out into into the meeting and people can be giving their feedback and as the results come in it presents it live on screen and it even gives you a QR code so if you've got your mobile phone and you're in the meeting you can scan that and still have that second pane of glass if you want to vote on that so we are seeing some similarities between commercial products if you haven't got a Slido license in your force and you were holding a large meeting you could now use forms and get that live feedback as the votes come back in to help again and to improve that interactivity and focus. So again, you can forms probably better for your pre-planned, your large events, your workshops or your training sessions where you can pre-plan them and have them in there, but still have that live interactivity you get from polls. But for using the polls for ad hoc meetings can really again help improve and get consensus of people moving through the meeting. Now I've mentioned whiteboard. Now whiteboard and Biv panel, and if you've seen whiteboard in the past, it has been improved again. And there are now templates which allow you to use the recommended templates uh, that are there. You even got games on there now: project planning, strategy, problem solving. You can use a whiteboard to get interaction. Now I'm just going to head over to whiteboard and just to bring that in and show you whiteboard in action because not everybody's seen it and not everybody's used it in the past. So I'll quickly open up whiteboard in the background. He says, hopefully that it's working. I am working remotely today. Uh, so there we go, there's whiteboard. So if you're in a meeting and you click the little tab to open whiteboard, you'll get a very similar experience. I'm opening whiteboard as a, as a separate application right now. And in typical demo fashion, it's taking its time, but it's getting there. If you're in a normal meeting, you wouldn't normally see the delay here. Oh, here we go. I'm going to have an error. Right. So you can create a new whiteboard. You can see I'm using it quite a lot at the moment. 
uh, as I work collaboratively with colleagues. And this is exactly the same as if you click whiteboard in a meeting, you get these templates in there that you can do. So I'm going to use this template as a template, or you can just start with blank. And now again, if you were in a meeting and you clicked, it's all the people who are already in the meeting would get a link. But I'm going to ask Gemma to pop herself into this uh, whiteboard and show how you can both at the same time post different comments on there. So Gemma's just been invited into the whiteboard. And again, there's been some recent improvements. So I want to put a post-it note on here about uh, webinar planning. Let's see if that's working. Type on there. So again, you can do the sort of thing that you can do in an office environment, but you can do it all remotely. So webinar planning. And I want to put notes on it. I want to change the colour of the post-it note is all there. And I can drag them around the screen, put them into boxes, or I have to say, right, so actually, I'm going to create a heading here for current work. Okay, and make that a bit small, so let me zoom in on the screen a little bit. I can see that I still have the, the uh, shift button down when I type the U, so I can go in and change that. A little bit harder than doing it on pen on a whiteboard. Make it a little bit bigger, and here's Gemma just coming in now. So I'll pop that in there. Zoom back out again, and Gemma's just putting her post it notes on. But I'm going to drag my post it notes onto that header there, and you can do this. And one of the other benefits is there's a recent addition you can now put a timer on the clock as well, so you can have a timer for people to work together uh, and to have a task to complete by, and it'll set an alarm off once we get to that time. Or again, the follow me if you want to make sure that people are following your presentation using the whiteboard you've got that functionality but there's so much in whiteboard that you can do uh, to be able to manage it put notes in clear comments and to really collaborate so don't think of having to do you can limit the capabilities in whiteboard and again a really powerful tool that can help collaboration planning and just think about it what you would do in an office you could use all all of that thanks Gemma and this is where co-authoring really can come in as well. And again, you can co-author whilst in a meeting. And there's times where, you know, PDS work completely virtually and we're collaborating on a presentation at the same time. We might need to invite a colleague in. And again, just click that share button, bring them in, have the comments and continue with the meeting all the way through. You can do that and collaborate and be sharing and working together. Perhaps one person will be sharing screen or you might even decide if you're co-authoring, you don't need to share screens. You can just continue, both edit different parts of the document at the same time. And because it's live and co-authoring, you can see that. So again, let me just show you that in action. I'm going to go over to the Word document that we use to help plan these webinars. You can see I've got Gemma and Esther in the meeting at the moment. They're all here. Uh, so if they click on a certain part of the document, I'll be able to see where they are. Uh, so there's Esther's cursor just appeared there. So if I hadn't got Esther's cursor on the screen, I can hover over Esther and I can go to the location where she is, where she's pointing at. Similarly with Gemma, go to the location, she's open on page one and we can all edit, contribute and manage at the same time. So again, you wouldn't normally have to screen share to do this, but you might be all chatting about a PowerPoint you're putting together or slides, looking at an Excel spreadsheet and meeting and discussing. This then allows you to do all of that at the same time in a really effective way. So co-authoring in meetings and you can, of course, be in a meet in a document co-authoring, not in a meeting and then just bring everybody together in an ad hoc meeting at the same time to discuss a point. So again, just think about how you can get more out of this. Going back to large format meetings just for a second, these are the ones. Now you're basically using the same technology as you offer at your ad hoc or your normal small meetings. The difference is you want to start managing those those options. So you have the options here, meeting options, where you can control who can bypass the lobby, who can come in and out, who the co-organizer is, and assign different roles. Who can present? And this is where if you started to assign roles to delegates and speakers, you can prevent others from sharing screen. It's particularly useful if you're doing training across virtual, uh, etc. And you want to make, have some control so you don't get any interruptions, or you're working with agencies, or perhaps doing a public meeting where you want to maintain control over the meeting and how it's working. And this button is the allow for attendees. Now, of course, you can set this when you set the invite out or dynamically through the meeting. And sometimes people think you you can't change these things. You just go simply to the three dots, 
go to meeting options and part way through a meeting you might want to increase the activity you can turn on the option for microphones and you can turn on or off the cameras functionality and you've also got control of when the meeting chat is available so the chat can happen before after and during the meeting and then again allows that to, to go on Again, you might be doing this as a, a meeting with stakeholders and you want to reduce the amount of reactions that are appearing that could distract you. And there's the control from there. And again, you've got that allow attendance report. So if you want to be able to review a meeting, who's actually turned up, when did they come in? Turning that little toggle on there means you, you after the meeting, you can go back to that meeting, go back to your recap and the meeting details. And you can download who attended and exactly what fraction of a second they joined to what fraction of a second they left and to be able to understand the value you got out of that particular session. So large format meetings are absolutely ideal for training sessions, large workshops. And again, one of the key things and points of difference is this is you can set up a way of registering them and joining them. So all you've got on screen right now is some of the options. Now this literally changed this morning for us in policing as we got to the functions. Now webinar, town hall, virtual appointments, live event may not be always on your screen, but these are the options that are available to police and you can arrange to have them. Town Hall is the new replacement for live events. So we'll cover that separately. Webinar is a way of creating a registration option for a large format meeting. We'll come to virtual appointments again in a second, but let's just focus on that webinar element. Now, again, unhelpfully, as a typical way, we call these our Wednesday webinars. Well, we actually produce them on a live event, so we're not using the same functionality as Microsoft call it. Um, a webinar is a large format meeting that allows you to have control over the delegates, microphones, cameras and functionality. So it's a normal Teams meeting experience, but with a registration page. So let me show you what that looks like. So you might have a meeting where you want to put it out to colleagues in force or it might be an external meeting. You want people to register to attend. Uh, and I know we've got some colleagues online today from the City of London communications teams. This is how we run the Association of Police Communicators uh, virtual academy each year. We run them through large meetings and we create a registration page. So how do you get to it? You go back to your webinar and you click new meeting in Teams calendar and click webinar option and you'll get this first screen that brings you up to create the meeting details. So you can see here yesterday I created one called meet webinar demo. You put a description of the meeting in and you have the organizer is just by default the person who arranged it. You then have the co-organizers who are people can help organize the event as well. And then another category of the people who are going to have presenting. So you, who do you want to speak at the event? And that can be external, internal people. You put their email address or their, their MS account name in and that will send them the invite. You've also got control whether you want this to be available just to people in your organisation or anybody outside the organisation and inside. So those are the basic options you have to fill in. Once you click save on that, you then get the options to be able to add the biographies of the speakers. And you can see there, I've created a little biography there for Gemma. You can put details in, put their LinkedIn profiles in. You can even add their photographs in to that. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. The next option you get is theming down the side and you can, you can brand it up because what you're basically doing here is creating a mini web page to allow people to register to attend this meeting and that creates that registration page so you can put the branding on there the color etc and of course you want to perhaps control the sort of information you want to gather in that form so in the registration configuration tab you can limit the capacity of the meeting so it sells out if you get more than 50 people there you can then add different fields that you want it to bring up so here you've got some default fields like job title which aren't asked for by default but i've selected them from the list it as a required field so they cannot get an invite to the meeting unless they fill that in and it does give you custom options as well extended status is where you go afterwards and you can have a look at the reporting but emails you can automatically you can now customize the email invite they get once they fill in the form as well that will automatically pick up the branding and theming that you put on it and you can send little messages to explain it to them there. And if you go into the emails, you'll see a lot of options of ways you can communicate with the delegates for a meeting. So a bit similar to what you've seen on Eventbrite, but built into the functionality you've got. Reports and uh, recordings will come later. This is where it's all about setting up the, the live event. So what does that look like in reality? You end up with a web page that's something like this, 
where you can create your registration page, the date, time and how to register are there. You can put the details so if you describe what the meeting is or the agenda into there and then you can put your speaker biographies in. So Gemma, I didn't fill in, I filled in mine. It brings in their photo, it even gives the LinkedIn link straight away. So what happens for the users who then want to attend the meeting, you send the link out, they click register and they get the simple form that appears here. And again, they fill in the mandatory fields which we've made. They read the terms and click to read the terms and conditions of the uh, privacy statements and terms. Click the register button and that automatically fires the process off to send them a meeting invite and to record them as a delegate who's likely to attend this meeting. And it allows the, the meeting organizer to send them emails to them to keep them updated and to have that register of attendance. So you can see how that can really help to be a useful tool when you're trying to arrange meetings or sessions. To, to help you move on. I know I'm running short of time. I've been talking for half an hour nearly already. I will mention virtual appointments and bookings. Virtual appointments, which I mentioned before, allow you allow giving you uh, control over appointments. So these are ideal for interviews or you want to arrange a, a consultation with somebody. They sit in the lobby effectively beforehand and they get all the meeting links. So do have a look at meeting them. But bookings again can be a really powerful tool for teams or departments. And we know we've got lots of examples of this being used in policing. Uh, the MPCC comms team use it, for example, to help arrange meetings and interviews. So you can build a default setting when you can have a meeting with somebody. You can make it basically a service so that you can simply send a link and people can book a meeting in somebody's calendar without you having to spend all that time to and fro in over meetings and who's available when and could this person be available. So that's a key point. So I'm just conscious of time. I haven't been able, keeping able to keep an eye on the q and I don't know if there's any come in from Esther or Gemma or Richard. There's a couple day. I can run through them really quickly. Um, uh, uh, I assume recap is only available if meetings are recorded. That's right. You need the meeting recap uh, to give you the recording and transcription. But if you didn't record it and just kept the notes, the, the, the notes and the contents would still be there. Fabulous. Uh, if you had, had a poll during the Teams meeting, can you look at the data later or does it disappear with the end of the meeting? Again, it should be in the meeting recap. I know sometimes it doesn't work as well as I thought from my experience. I think I've raised a ticket on it in the past, uh, but it should be in the meeting recap now uh, as well as part of the results. And in the live chat, sometimes you'll find the poll data and the results are in the chat area. Fabulous. And in the same vein, just adding to that, can you use the attendance report after the meeting has ended, of course? Uh, of course, and yeah, you get that both on the live events and on large format or even the small meetings. If you turn that on, you get uh, the email address and all the details that uh, Microsoft knows about the user from their account, including the date and time when they entered, when they didn't, etc. So it can be a really valuable piece of data to use to evaluate the value of the meeting and the effectiveness. Fabulous. And one last question, really important one. Is the same functionality available if we're creating a meeting in Outlook or do we need to create and manage functionality in Teams? If you create a meeting in Outlook, it's going to be the standard meeting. It's, it gets better practice. You get all those choices and functionalities of um, that you get in when you set it into you, certainly for live events, for virtual meetings and for webinars, they have to be accessed through the Teams calendar. However, if you create a meeting in Outlook, then the options to make uh, bypass lobby, turn on mics and all that lot are all in the Outlook calendar entry as well, because it's the same calendar entry. It's just two different platforms to access it. Fabulous. I think that's a quick run through. There is a very lengthy question in there from James Wood. I won't go into detail. You've covered it quite well, actually, in that last answer. So uh, that's it, Dave. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. I know it wasn't the planned webinar, but I think hopefully a lot of you got some value out of it because there's a lot in this tools. And even when I was planning this one yesterday, I learned something new. And literally this morning, as I was on the train, the uh, new uh, town hall functionality game available that's what we've got coming up soon please join us again for our next webinars we try and limit them to half an hour and i've broken my own rule gone over my own half hour perhaps that was the challenge of presenting do attend us for join us for those workshops they're all on the pds website so i hope you can join us again very soon and thanks for your comments and questions today